All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a blessing and honor to be here again this week. Uh, for those that have not met me, my name is Doug LaPointe, just some guy, you know. Uh, loves, loves the Lord dearly. Uh, I'd love to share my story if you'd like to hear it. But um, we're here to study the Word of God. And uh, I'll invite you to open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians. We're going to continue our study there, verse by verse, as far as we get this week and the next. We made it through a whopping four verses last week. Uh, so we will start in verse 5. And as you're finding 1 Thessalonians, I'm going to open us in a word of prayer. Our Father God, we are so thankful this morning, uh, knowing that you are offering grace and peace to this world still. Sometimes it comes as a shock to us, but we are thankful, Father, for your long-suffering, uh, for your love, for your creation and um, for your love for mankind too, that, that, that all may be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Thankful for this morning that we can dive into your word and study your word. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would fill us with your wisdom, uh, that we may walk worthy of that vocation wherewith we are called, that we may represent you well as your ambassadors to redeem the time because these days sure are evil. Uh, but I'm thankful for this time we can gather together, edify one another in grace and peace. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, I'll try to give a brief recap on 1 Thessalonians, the first four verses. So uh, I'll actually start in verse 1. Here it, are. it says, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the, of the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor and love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren beloved, your election of God. So last time we talked about Paul's unique ministry, briefly, let's say, found out we're all pretty well grounded in that here, uh, where this letter most likely has its place in Scripture. The spoiler is Acts 18. Uh, if you want to argue that, I'm totally open. I <laughs> uh, just wanted to let you know where most uh, Bible students, shall we say, most commentators put it, uh, just to, in the context of the history. But then we spend a little bit more time talking about verses 2, 3, and 4. Uh, how amazing and how wonderful it is to give thanks to God for other saints. And you think about that every morning that we get together. Last time we talked about what's our motivation, right? And it's such a joy to be among saints, isn't it? Uh, it's a joy to share the gospel to those who may not have heard the good news of Jesus Christ. Don't get me wrong about that. But to come to a place where whether it's this building or each other's houses, it's just such a joy. Uh, and last night I had, <laughs> had the privilege of waking up in the middle of the night and while I was unable to fall back asleep, I just to took some time to think about all the saints that God has brought me into contact with uh, in Oshkosh, in Friendship, all these places in Wisconsin. Those that are abroad, I think you're familiar with Things to Come Mission here. Uh, several of those missionaries I've met in person. There's even another one, Arctic Barnabas, which I'd never heard of, um, but in Wisconsin, we have this thing called the EAA, where it stands for Experimental Aircraft Association. It's the biggest gathering of planes from all over the world in the entire world. Population of Oshkosh goes from about 70,000 to about a million for one week. And it's people that have built their own planes. They camp out uh, in the, the grounds there on the, at the airport. I don't know how they do it. <laughs> I grew up with it, so it wasn't that spectacular to me. I, I love planes, but um, it's amazing. There's several ministries that work with that. Missionary pilots, that's the biggest recruiting event, is at the EAA for missionary pilots. And they fly to places like Arctic Barnabas. It's a place in Alaska. Uh, Dan and Julie Potner, if you're interested, I'll give you more information. But they fly into the bush, what they call uh, the places without a postal code in Alaska and to support pastors among villagers. It's quite, it's pretty amazing. So there, I, you know, just to take a moment and think, wow, God, you're working amazingly through these people. 
You know, giving them planes, like all of a sudden someone wanted to sell them a plane. That's pretty awesome, <laughs> you know, to carry on in that ministry. But what a joy it is to give thanks to God always for saints, a constant in prayer. Verse 3, remembering without ceasing your work of love, faith, excuse me, labor of love, patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we talked about that. We're not earning our faith. I think we talked about that here. It's living it out. What you believe gets lived out, uh, fleshed out, if you will. I know we don't like the term flesh, uh, understanding what that is in Scripture. It's, it's ourselves, our body apart from God. But uh, living out our faith, that's what that is. Labor of love, uh, more along the same line, and patience of our hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's a pretty big theme in this book, so we'll talk more about that in a little while. And then we spent just a little bit of time on verse 4, knowing, brethren beloved, your election of God. This is intuitive knowledge now. Studying what it means to be in Christ, learning uh, your identity, my identity in Christ, we know with full assurance our election of God. Not that God pre-selected us for salvation, he pre-selected those in Christ for salvation. Those that are in Christ may have all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. Those that are in Christ have peace with God. They are holy and without blame, unreprovable. You know, all those things we took a little bit of time to talk about last week. So with that, are there any lingering thoughts, questions, or comments before we move on? Yes, sir. Sounds good. All right, let's go here. Verse 5, it says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. And from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith is to God word is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how he turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And I'm going to pause there to really emphasize verse 10. But going back to verse 5, so they preached the gospel, right? Our gospel came not unto you in word only. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? As you read in 1 Corinthians, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So they preached the word, they preached the gospel. Remember our gospel, that possessive, that unique gospel to Paul, we're saved by grace through faith apart from works. Right? Jesus paid it all. It's a great song, isn't it? Uh, so we know that, that God did that for us through Jesus Christ, but also, it says in verse 5, in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. Now he gives us some context to that in, at the end of that verse where he says, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. So a couple things were going on here back in Acts 18 in the book of Acts, I could say. Uh, last time we spent a little bit of time talking about the sign gifts, right? The healing, the tongues, the knowledge, the prophecy, all that stuff. That was still in full swing when Paul, Silvanus, and Timotheus were at Thessalonica. I'll just, if you want to put a marker here, keep your finger, turn back to Acts chapter 19. Just to show some of the stuff that was going on at that time, Acts 19, verse 11. <clears throat> now we saw the, uh, as you're turning there, we saw the historical movement of Paul, how he went from Philippi, we're going to talk about that too in Acts 16, to Thessalonica in Acts 17, got chased out of there by those lewd fellows of the baser sort. Uh, I'm going to use that phrase a lot, I really enjoy that phrase. <laughs> But he stirred up some rioters, essentially, in Thessalonica, ch chased them out to Berea. They found out they were there, got those same guys, apparently, and went over to Berea, chased them out of there, and he went to Athens. Acts 18, he went to Corinth. Here in verse, or I'm sorry, in chapter 19, 
Uh, he's in Ephesus, if you look at verse 1. But I'm, I just want to jump down to verse 11 and get to the punchline. It says, And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs, or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Crazy stuff, huh? And then you got this very interesting account of the sons of Sceva, which I'm not... That's like another discussion in and of itself. Uh, well, you know what? I do like what they say. Let's, let's actually take a moment to look at this. Because it says there were seven sons... Oh, I'm sorry, verse 13. There, then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, <laughs> took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. That's just so silly to me, isn't it? <laughs> this, this guy that Paul preaches, they must have seen what was going on with Paul, right? These special miracles that were happening by his hands. They see the evil spirits depart from them and say, yeah, I want to do that too. <laughs> so they, they, they say, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. In verse 14, there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, a chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, and this is just fascinating, where he says, Jesus I know, and Paul I know. But who are ye? <laughs> really makes you think about those promises that nobody really likes, but we understand in practicality how that those that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Paul was marked, wasn't he? And Jesus he knew, Paul he knew, but who are you? <laughs> Those of us that are in Christ, we have that privilege, right? And not only to believe on Jesus, but to suffer with him. I believe that's in Philippians. So I, I just wanted to point that part out. It's part of the believer's walk. But you see here that there were special miracles going on by the hand of Paul. There were, in 1 Corinthians 14, he's, he says to the Corinthians that I, I thank God that I speak tongues more than ye all. You know, so he's, there's, there were miracles going on. So here is that in power, in the Holy Ghost, in much assurance. But then, again, back to 1 Thessalonians verse 5 in chapter 1, where he says, As ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. So not only did they talk the talk, but they walked that talk. Now we're going to see more of that in chapter 2. So Paul, Sylvanus, Timotheus, they come to Thessalonica, they preach the word, they see these things going on. Verse 6, it says, ye became followers of us and of the Lord. So they grabbed onto that word. They saw what manner of men these guys were, and they did it too. All right? They wanted that. They chased after that with zeal, as we'll, we'll see here. It says, they having received the word in much affliction. Now, three words that are very easy to pass over. But as we recall, those lewd fellows of the baser sort entered in pretty quickly onto the scene, didn't they? Paul only reasoned in the synagogues of Thessalonica for three Sabbath days, it says back in Acts 17. And so he wasn't there for very long until they were chased out. So they received the word in much affliction. But that's not all. It says with joy of the Holy Ghost. Isn't that amazing? You know, going back to last week, like thinking about what is our motivation. The gospel of Christ is just too good of news that no matter what's going on, we, every day, every week, it seems that the, the world is falling more and more into disrepair, you know, uh, both um, physically and spiritually, morally. But we have that joy of the Holy Ghost. You know, it, it, we have that full assurance of who we are in Christ. We are saved for eternity, sealed, blessed, and delivered in Christ. Uh, delivered. I'm going to get to that in just a moment. But so much so that they trusted in God's word, and that's the key. Yeah, that's what I keep challenging everywhere I go, is where is your heart at? Where is my heart at? Do we trust God at his word? And that's, that's the question to ask. As we study our Bibles, we're going to come across passages that are going to be difficult to understand at some point. But do we just say, okay, God, I don't understand it, but I trust you that that's true. I believe you. And then perhaps move on until understanding comes along. 
But we, do we trust God at his word? We are sealed under the day of redemption. We cannot lose our salvation in Christ. No matter what we do, despite our best efforts, we are going to heaven. <laughs> Which is wonderful news. Right? We have all sins forgiven. We're complete in Christ. Do we trust him at that? To have that joy of the Holy Ghost. So that we too, verse 7, can be in samples to all. Let's put it that way. But these saints at Thessalonica were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you, the saints at Thessalonica, sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God were to spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. Powerful testimony, isn't it? That's why I, I, it was on my heart to share last week's message about our motivation. Do we have that same drive? Do we have that same zeal that no matter what comes our way, it will stand firm in the Lord Jesus Christ and what God says, what does the Bible say? Because that gets spoken about, whether people hate it or not, because I've, I've had people swear at me, I've had people uh, <laughs> blaspheme me, not that I really care, you know, but they're still, despite what they're trying to do dis, um, to challenge my character, my integrity, they end up preaching Jesus Christ because that's what I stand for. So, every place, it says, your faith to God were spread abroad. Verse 9, for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So we get an idea of what was going on there in Thessalonica, some sort of paganism, idolistic worship, or idolatry. But when Paul, Silvanus, Timotheus, those guys that turned the world upside down are come here too, as it says back in the book of Acts, this group of people, these saints, they completely turned away from their idols. They went straight toward the word of truth. They went straight toward the one true God. And so that is, that is what they're spoken of. Anyone have any thoughts or comments to share so far? Thank you, thank you. Powerful stuff, yeah. That's, yeah, I, to give you a little insight, I don't mind being candid. As I study the scriptures, I read through stuff like this, I think to myself, how am I doing compared to that? Yeah, and that's quite the challenge to myself. Because some days I don't, I don't think I hit the mark at all. <laughs> and some days it's just, it's completely opposite. Wow, that was awesome, God. But I give thanks to God for working mightily through me. Because I know that's not my flesh doing that. <laughs> all right, well, I wanted to spend at least a little bit of time emphasizing the power and the glory from verse 10. Because there's some people that do some... Uh, what do they call it, exegetical gymnastics, to make this verse say what it does not say. So not only did these saints of Thessalonica turn to God from idols and serve the living and true God. They were serving false gods before. Can't help but emphasize that too. But they serve now the living and true God, verse 10, to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he, God, raised from the dead, even Jesus, if we needed more emphasis on who this was, right? So God the Father, we wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which did what? Delivered us from the wrath to come. That sounds really good, but we should define what is the wrath of God so we know what we are delivered from, wouldn't you say? Now, I know we're pretty well versed, here, so I'm willing to give the short story. <laughs> Otherwise, I spent 12 weeks talking about this back in Wisconsin. So, are we familiar with what the wrath of God is? Maybe I'll ask this question. Has the wrath of God occurred yet? No. Is God pouring out his wrath right now? No. <laughs> Coronavirus is an unfortunate circumstance. I know that. What, no matter what we believe about that. I could easily share my opinions about that too. But it is what it is. And you know, things like hurricanes, we deal with that a lot down here. 
more so than what I dealt with in Wisconsin. I didn't think about hurricanes very much. Blizzards, on the other hand, <laughs> dealt with that often. We had to cancel services due to the weather for that reason, uh, because it's not wise to drive when there's 36 inches of snow on the ground. So there's that. But is that the wrath of God? No. And that comes from, I know what we're going to talk about, I don't know if we'll talk about that topic in particular, but comes from the renewing of our mind. What is God doing in this world today? Why does the world do what it does today? Why is there, why is there death in the world today? We need to understand it comes from this world being subjected to the curse. Uh, that's probably the short version of Romans 8. Right? The whole creation is groaning and travailing together until that day where we are made new. Right? Waiting for the redemption of the sons of God, the, the heirs, the children of God. So that's what the world is waiting for. Until then, we're going to see the consequences of a sin-cursed world. We're going to see nasty weather. We're going to see animal attacks, unfortunately. I heard of a bunch of dog mauling stories around this, uh, not this area, but up in uh, Spring Hill, uh, near where I live. You know? So there's unfortunate circumstances like that. I have not... I've seen gators, but I've uh, not gotten very close, and I don't intend to. But, you know, there's, there's that that we have to deal with, too. Up north, it was bears and wolves and other things like that. Well, how do we reconcile that? What about other things that hit pretty close to home, like cancer? There's a guy that is also named LaPointe. I'm not related to him, but I just heard that he was diagnosed with bone cancer, and it is intense. He, the doctors say he's got two weeks to live and don't bother with any treatment. That is... Horrible. I hate that. And the reason I can emphasize saying I hate that is because God hates death. That's an enemy. That's not the way it's supposed to be. So now I'm getting a little sidetracked. Apologize. But what is this wrath? Is that part of the wrath? No. That's a consequence of a sin-cursed world. Uh, the wrath to come is defined in several places, but we've got to go back to the prophets for that. And I'll give you the short story. If you'd like to go into detail, please let me know, okay? So Daniel 9 gives us a timeline. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and thy holy city. So 70 periods of seven years were determined for Israel and for Jerusalem. That's what that means. If you want to challenge me, find a scripture, because I have not found one yet that talks otherwise. <laughs> but this is for Israel, for Jerusalem, and it's going to fill up everything. That's a, that's a paraphrase of Daniel 9.24. 69 of those weeks are done, done and gone. They, Israel, were on the brink of going through that final week and entering into their promised kingdom. That's why Jesus said the kingdom is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Mark 1.14. So Jesus told Israel that your kingdom is here. Really fascinating when the, um, John the Baptist sent messengers to him and asked him, are you the one to come or are we to wait for another? Have you ever thought about that verse? Interesting, isn't it? Because John the Baptist was filled from the Holy Ghost from his womb. But what I'll contend, and I'm open to argument for this, is that um, he recognized there must be another coming because Jesus did not come on the Mount of Olives. Now, he didn't come in all that power, so perhaps he recognized there's another coming and Jesus reminded him, you see all these things happening. Yes, it's me. Right, so there's, there's a little paraphrase, dogology, if you will. But the wrath was to come if Israel would accept him as Messiah. But they didn't, right? You go through the book of Acts, and Israel rejected him pretty much all along the way. Acts 2, Peter said, you killed your Messiah. Now repent. Change your mind about him. He is the Christ. He's the one that's supposed to sit on the throne of David. And at that day, 3,000 were added to the church. The church already existed, the church of Israel, if you will. So they were already there, the little flock, Luke 12, 32, if you hear that phrase. Uh, that's Israel, the believing remnant of Israel. And they sold their, all, their, all their things, had all things common, and that was the pattern because they wouldn't need any of that stuff going through the wrath of God. That's what it's termed, that last seven weeks, the day of vengeance. This is not turning out to be a short story, is it? <laughs> but that's what the prophets talked about. It's a day of darkness, it says in Amos. You don't want this. 
Um, Jeremiah 30, verse 7, it's the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, Jacob's trouble, Israel's trouble. So that, that period of seven years was supposed to be that trouble. Revelation gives us the details. Okay, and that's sent to Israel. It's the Apostle John saying, I was in the Lord, in the Spirit, on the Lord's day. In the Lord's day? In? Little words make a big difference. But he's talking about that day of the Lord. You know, the day of wrath. You see that phrase a lot in the prophets. In that day. And sometimes they're talking about a short-term thing, but usually it's talking about that day of vengeance. So that wrath is a seven-year period where Israel will be God's witnesses preaching that everlasting gospel. Right, so that, uh, how about that's about as much as I'll say. But Jesus, or, uh, yes, Jesus, Jesus delivered us from that wrath to come. That's what it says here. Because God set aside Israel for a time, for a season, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Okay, so we have this parenthetical age, uh, if you've heard of that, where we live, called the dispensation of the grace of God, because Israel in prophecy was set aside for a season to usher in right now what God is offering to the entire world, grace and peace, not wrath, and it will end with us being delivered from the wrath to come. Most call this the rapture, and we'll talk about that in chapter 4. Whether we get there verse by verse or not, I want to talk about it at least next week. <laughs> we will see. Any thoughts, questions, concerns about that? Right on. Okay, let's move on then. Chapter 2, verse 1, he says, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that, we had suffered before, and were shamefully entreated. As ye know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For, well, yeah, let me just pause briefly. You remember the account at Philippi, where he got the evil spirit out of the damsel, which brought her masters much gain. And they got so mad about losing their money, they beat him up and threw him in prison. And Paul and Silas's reaction was to sing songs of praise to God. <laughs> Powerful testimony once again. I don't know if I'd have that fortitude. I pray to God I would. But um, that just makes you stop and think when you read about those testimonies. And so they were shamefully entreated there, but we were bold in God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. Just because they went on to Thessalonica doesn't mean it got any easier. In verse 3 it says, For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts." For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Nor of men saw we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. There's a lot, if we want to, to talk about in those verses. Essentially, you see the common theme. We're not doing this for any gain of our own. We did it for you. Right? We did not hide anything from you, Paul is essentially saying. And I love that term, a cloak of covetousness. There's no hidden agenda. There's no fine print. There's no, you know, the salesman where you have to call about something or another. I'm about to purchase a house, so I thought about buying a home warranty. I decided to forgo it. But, um, you know, when you call those guys and the salesman, they're out to get a sale. That's their job. I'm not going to blame them. I'm not going to say they're evil. <laughs> you know, that's what they're to do. But you know there's a lot of wiggle room when you say no, and they, they do something to sweeten that deal. And then you say no again, and they add a little bit more. And not to say that there's a cloak of covetousness, but maybe a hint of it, because they're looking for something, right? Not so with the gospel of Christ. I just use that as a silly example. But you see that here, that we're not here to hide anything. And me too, and Brother Chris, from what I've gotten to know of him, not at all. And there's some, I can't even say that, there's some uh, pastors, teaching elders, whatever term you like, that are like that. This, I'm not in it for me. I want to edify the saints. I want to be edified by you all. Now, to share God's word 
without a cloak of covetousness, without flattering words. Now, not seeking glory of men uh, in verse 6 there, but he said they had that power as the apostles of Christ. They could have essentially demanded some carnal things, some support from them. Now, not to say that it's wrong for those to ask for support for certain ministries, but to, you know, that's like a whole other discussion there. But they chose not to. Right, that's the point. They chose not to even bother, even though they were apostles of Christ. Verse 7, it says, But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. This is good stuff, isn't it? really makes you think... Am I acting that way? Am I showing God's love toward the saints? Do I act as a nurse with cherishing her children to all, all the saints around me? Because that's how they said, not the gospel of God only. Yeah, that's great. I love to share the gospel of Christ. But then, what needs do you have and how can I help? I was honored uh, to help out a couple uh, that were cleaning their father's house out because he had passed away. And they were almost neighbors. They're across the canal and across the street. We can see them from the window. <laughs> uh, but we knew that, the, fa the, the father that lived in that house, and we went over there to, to talk with them. And uh, myself and my brother-in-law, we helped them lug a whole bunch of heavy stuff from their house down to the, the pod, you know, to, to move out. So it, just to help out. You know, we didn't have to. We didn't ask for anything. We just did it because we wanted to. Where did I leave off? Verse 9? Okay, so you're dear unto us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Yeah, so going back to uh, chapter 1, where it says, uh, verse 5, what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Again, he's emphasizing this is how we behaved. This gospel of Christ, it's not just uh, some, something we do on Sundays. It's not just some documentation. This is a real life. You know, I trust in Christ, now he lives in me, and now the life which I now live, I live under the Son of God who died and gave himself for me. Now, it's, it's not just some super, superficial facade. It's, a real, it's the real deal. <laughs> now, so that's how we live, how holy and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you, to walk with integrity. Now that comes from our identity of who we are in Christ, knowing our identity in Christ. And I pause there to really emphasize verse 11 in, through 13. It says, As ye know how we charged, <laughs> how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Now this really hits home with me, because I understand what it is to be a father. <laughs> now don't get me wrong, mothers do this too in your own unique way. But I know as a father with my children, I am constantly challenging them to step up. You know, just like my father did to me, just like coaches and teachers and other influential role models did for me, uh, how we exhort, comfort, and charge every one of you. Step up. Walk worthy. This is who you are in Christ. Now act like it. We all need help in that department, don't we? <laughs> every day we face temptations. We face the choice, do I follow after my own flesh and quench the spirit? Or do I allow God's word to work effectually in me and to live my life under the Son of God who died and gave himself for me? Coming back to Galatians 2.20 a few times here. 
But you see that in verse 12, that you would walk worthy of God. That call I see here to a maturity in faith. I have no doubts here, we're all pretty mature in faith, but as we look around Christianity and several other church buildings or gatherings of what I would hope are mostly saints, but I don't know, <laughs> because they do not preach God's word rightly divided, and there is some, there's a lot of confusion there. How to awaken that zeal, that zeal unto good works, to share the truth in love to mature in faith, not only know who our God is through Jesus Christ in His earthly ministry, recognizing His characteristics, because we can learn a lot in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about who God is, but to know how He's working with mankind today, what He's offering today, who we are in Christ today, we need to go beyond that. We need to do what God says and to study to show ourselves approved unto God. Each one of us sitting here or listening online need to study for ourselves. That is, that's going to be a main part of the teaching uh, later this morning, to be renewed by the transforming of our minds, to think critically. Uh, no matter what is said in a pulpit or what is said outside of these walls, think about it. Is that really true? No, not just to take it as truth, but as we uh, see the example of the Bereans, to study to see whether these things are so. I know when I've covered these verses before, I've had questions on verse 12, how he had called you unto his kingdom and glory. I think we talked about that before. <laughs> but I know when we, whenever I come to the word kingdom or whenever I come to the word gospel, I ask myself this question, which one? Because when you start asking questions about the context, it becomes clear. Is he talking about the kingdom on earth that he was talking about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Not at all. <laughs> You're right. No, he's talking about that dominion of his kingship. That's what kingdom means. We see the same kind of thing in Colossians. If you want to turn to Colossians chapter 1, just a few pages to your left. Colossians 1 verse 13, verse 12 where it says, giving thanks unto the Father. This is the who in verse 13, so that's why I went back there. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, the authority of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Now, same teaching here. We are no longer in Adam. We're no longer dead in trespasses and sins. We are, have been baptized now by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. We've been translated from the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Does that make sense? He's not talking about an earthly kingdom at all. That's for Israel, and that is coming for a certainty. <laughs> it's God said it. It's probably about as fast as I've covered that one. Any questions or challenges at all? Outstanding. <laughs> All right, let's just move on. Uh, here, well, you know, verse 13 reminds me of um, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. You're probably pretty familiar with those, right? For all scripture is inspired of God and is profitable for doctrine, for rebuke, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped uh, fully equipped, for, truly furnished unto all good works. Uh, stumbled a little bit, but that's the idea. <laughs> when the Word of God is preached, we ought to receive that as truth. Go back to the Word of God, and He is true. Right? Romans 3, 4, let God be true and every man a liar. But that Word of God, even if we don't understand it, ha meditating on it, memorizing Scripture, that Word will work effectually in us that believe you will notice the maturation process. And think back to the day where you first understood the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
and then think back to the day where you first understood rightly dividing the word of truth. All right? For me, there was a pretty big gap in between. Uh, and some of you may, may relate to that. And so I learned a whole bunch of false doctrine that I had to unlearn and replace it with the one true word of God. So that, but that word of God started working effectually in me now that I believed, and that changed my walk. Right? So that's, this is essentially the process, is that we get saved, we come to the knowledge of the truth, and then we walk worthy of that calling. Okay? So we let that word of God work effectually in us. Verse 14, it says, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which, are in, Jude which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men. It's a lot of ands there. But it doesn't stop, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins all way, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. That's pretty scary to me. <laughs> and we'll probably take the remainder of this time. Well, is it 1030? That I should stop? <laughs> Whoops. All right. Well, let's just end with this thought then. I'll give you, let's take this for homework for next week. How about that? Yeah. We can get homework in Sunday school. Because verse 14 it can be a stumbling block for some. Churches in Judea which are in Christ. Okay, what church is that? Who makes those? I'm just asking these questions. You don't have to answer. That'll be for next week. Who is in those churches in Judea which are in Christ who suffered their own uh, things from their own countrymen called Jews? <laughs> Open book test. They killed Jesus and the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. So we get, we get some interesting things to think about in that how that God is going to pour out his wrath upon the children of disobedience, and there appears to be different degrees of wrath in the lake of fire. So that's really bad news. But we are saved from the wrath to come. I can't end on bad news. Jesus Christ delivered us. We trust in him and who he is, what he did for us, and we won't experience one second of that. So let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for that grace and peace that we have in Jesus Christ. Thank you for working out salvation through him and imputing that to all them that believe. I pray, Lord, if there's not a soul amongst us this morning that's listening to this, that today they choose as their day of salvation, that they trust what you've done through Jesus, that he died, was buried, and rose again, and that act provides salvation. Thank you, Lord, for a gospel so simple and so full and true and complete. We're so thankful for that. Uh, may you help us to walk worthy of this vocation as a saint in Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.